So this is the first piece in a conversation about um, intelligence analysis skills. Um, and here we'll be introducing this concept of judgment and how we differentiate uh, good judgment versus bad judgment and some of the um, research that's been done, particularly by a guy named Phil Tetlock on how human beings sort of form judgments. And so I think it's maybe worth distinguishing between two different types of judgments. Um, one is prediction, right? Prediction is a statement about the future, what will happen or what's likely to happen. And then there can also be judgments about the state of the world today, right? An assessment or analysis um, where in theory, um, it's possible to actually arrive at a, at a true correct conclusion about what's actually happening today, whereas you can't with the future, right? The future is necessarily unknown, um, but uncertainty is sort of common or, or at least inherent in, in prediction, but common in any sort of assessment just because um, countries may obscure their intentions, there's information that we don't know, there's things that we can't observe. We're always sort of navigating some of that uncertainty. And when we're thinking about prediction, we're oftentimes relying upon data and we're using theory to kind of move ourselves forward. With assessment, the idea is that we should be able to collect the data that we need um, to be able to form our judgment, and that that judgment should be grounded in that data. Um, I sort of go back and forth on this. And a number of years ago, I had a, a CIA recruiter come to my class and one of the students asked, um, when forming judgments and predictions, um, should you be looking at the documents? Should you be looking at the data? Or should you be using sort of your imagination and your creativity to read between the lines? Um, I was very pleased with the response of, of the, the recruiter at that particular moment, which is no, analysis and judgment should be grounded in the data. We don't sort of make things up. And I appreciated that because the student had sort of been spinning wildly and sort of been adding to one of the projects that I had had um, and going, going well outside the, the data that I had provided. But on the other hand, I was somewhat conflicted by that because data doesn't exist sort of in a vacuum. Um, what we understand of data, what it means, how it might influence things, all of that is sort of related to theory. We bring with us our biases um, as we understand and interpret that data. And there's really no way around that. Um, however, in a subsequent conversation, we'll talk about um, how to check that bias, how to make sure that bias isn't driving our results and to maybe sort of um, find a way to navigate that. When we're thinking about judgment and, and predictions and what makes something a good judgment versus a bad judgment, um, Tetlock makes a really useful distinction. He says um, that good judgment is being able to see things correctly and clearly and to do that before it becomes conventional wisdom, right? Good judgment implies you are on the cutting edge of seeing the trends and, and the patterns and recognizing what's going on. Whereas bad judgment means that you belatedly recognize reality. You belatedly come around to what everyone else has realized. That's a sign that you're not doing a very good job taking the information that you have and forming a realistic picture about the world. Um, Tetlock also says that when we're thinking about um, predictions, that we should be thinking about those predictions in terms of the baseline probabilities of events. And this is maybe a little bit of a, maybe not the most intuitive idea, but I think once we sort of step back and kind of work through what he's actually getting at, I think it makes a lot of sense, right? So if I make a prediction that tomorrow the sun is going to rise, um, I don't get a lot of kudos for getting that one right. Um, people sort of shrug and say, well, that was an easy prediction. The sun rises every single morning. It always happens. The fact that you correctly predicted that doesn't mean that you are a good or insightful forecaster. Um, whereas things that are much more rare, like let's say one country invading another country, uh, things that happen maybe 1% or less. If I say next week, Iran is gonna invade Saudi Arabia and that comes to pass, I'm gonna get a lot of kudos for that. That's gonna be recognized as a good judgment because I anticipated something that had a very low probability of happening and I correctly anticipated that, that particular event. And so Tetlock sort of suggests that, that we should be thinking about those baseline probabilities when we're tallying up whether or not somebody got it right or whether they got it wrong. And then I would also maybe add to this that good predictions, particularly predictions about the future, predictions are about the future, um, should use signposts, particularly when you're sort of predicting out a ways. And signposts are just sort of forward-looking statements about what we anticipate the process of getting from here to our prediction is going to look like. And so if I anticipate, um, you know, that we'll see 
uh, alliance system emerging in Asia um, around China's rising power and that countries will sort of mobilize against China, I should be able to spell out sort of what will that look like? And maybe there'll be a crisis um, between China and one of its neighbors that raises alarms for other countries. And maybe I'll point to there'll be, there should be a conference or there should be a flurry of diplomatic activity and that it will snowball into some sort of NATO-like structure for Asia, right? Maybe that's a plausible story. That's a prediction about the future. But you can at least sort of look at that that story and say, well, in order for that, in order to get to that NATO of Asia kind of system, there has to be a crisis that sparks fear. There has to be a diplomatic piece. Like it has to follow that path. Those are signposts. And if we're laying out signposts in a clear way, people can very early recognize early people can recognize if our predictions are playing out as expected or if we've sort of veered off course and our prediction is maybe not going to be as useful um, any longer. When we're thinking about different types of predictions um, from a policy perspective, it's, I think, useful to sort of differentiate between false alarms um, and missed calls um, versus situations where we get things right. And there may be different policy implications for being right or being wrong, um, being overly careful or, or not careful enough um, that might factor into how policymakers work with the judgment and work with the predictions that they're given. And so one way to think about this is, you know, if we're thinking about predicting an event and I say this event will happen and that happens, everybody's happy with that. But if I predict that an event is going to happen and it doesn't happen, is that a problem? Well, it depends. What steps did people take in response to my prediction? And if those steps were fairly minor, fairly minimal, maybe it's not a big deal, right? If those steps were massive, if things got completely reorganized and restructured, people might look at that and say, wow, you know, you cried the sky was falling, the sky didn't fall, and, you know, bad things happened as we tried to, to run around trying to fix things. Um, Another example I could give you is with COVID tests. That seems to be something folks are fairly familiar with. And one of the problems with COVID tests is that you can test um, positive even though you don't have COVID, right? So the, the downside on that is that you end up quarantining for 10 days and it's inconvenient, but it's maybe not the end of the world. Whereas if you're able to identify quickly that you have COVID, um, that is something that can help reduce the spread. And so maybe we, we live with a test that has a fairly large or even a moderately large um, false positive um, rate. We could also think about those missed calls, what it means when an event occurs and we didn't anticipate it, right? So if I'm, you know, a, an analyst before World War II and I say Japan is not going to invade the United States or attack the United States and the Pearl Harbor attack comes, that's kind of a big deal. Getting that kind of a call wrong is, is, is a real problem. Um, but there's other, you know, false uh, or missed calls that might not matter at all. Um, you know, if I, my spam filter identifies an invitation to participate in a webinar and throws it into spam and I miss that webinar, well, I mean, the spam filter getting it wrong isn't the end of the world, things will go on. And so when we're thinking about judgment and evaluating judgment and evaluating sort of the risks of getting it right and wrong, we really have to understand that in terms of what that means for policy, what that means for consequences, what that means for reaction, um, because that's going to change how policymakers will navigate the level of uncertainty that's just inherent in every prediction that we make. Um, Tetlock did a lot of work studying human predictions. He runs sort of the Good Judgment Project, which is kind of a fun little online project where you can make your own predictions about events. Um, and he's been tracking these for these predictions that people make for decades, um, and has noted some some things about human prediction and forecasting. Um, one of those is that most human beings are really terrible at making predictions. Um, he sort of compares human prediction to a dart throwing chimp where you just sort of put up a bunch of options and you sort of throw at them randomly. Human beings do slightly better than that on average, about 7% better. Um, the best predictions, I should say the best predictors, what um, Tetlock has identified as, as these super forecasters um, will do much better than a dart throwing chimp, 20%. Um, he's found that a theoretical models, basically just predicting that tomorrow will look like today, do 30% better than a dart throwing chimp. And actual statistical models, um, the way that academics do, can do 50% better than a dart 
throwing chimp, which suggests that human decision making or human prediction is um, maybe prone to some some real problems. Um, and in, in thinking through sort of where human beings get it so wrong, um, Tetlock uh, has sort of differentiated between discriminate predictions and calibrated predictions. And so a discriminate prediction is you got it right or you got it wrong, right? I said Iran is going to attack Saudi Arabia next week. They didn't attack Saudi Arabia. I got it wrong, right? So what's your your success rate in terms of how, what percentage of the time do you get it right versus what percentage of the time do you get it wrong? Um, the other thing that he looks at is when you make your prediction, do you make a, a statement about how confident you are? And are you saying that you're 100% confident this is going to play out? Are you 50% confident? Are you 10% confident? And if I say uh, there's a 10% chance that country A is going to invade country B next week, and 90% of the time I'm wrong, but 10% of the time I'm right, my average isn't going to look very good. But I was saying there's a low probability of this event happening, and my in sort of intuitive sense of how frequently this should be happening seems to line up with reality. And that's what sort of that calibrated prediction is, is, is sort of at. It's about how your predictions align in terms of the, the probabilities that you, you set to them. Um, and so what he finds is that sort of in this lower, um, this graph is terrible. It's just ridiculously difficult to read, um, but I'll talk through some of the things going on. Um, so in sort of the lower bottom left corner, um, you have what um, Tetlock identifies as the worst category of uh, predictors, um, university undergrads who have bad calibration and bad discriminant predictions. They get it wrong uh, frequently. Um, then he moves into these hedgehogs, hedge foxes, fox hogs, and foxes. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means in a, in a second here. And there's a story that goes along with that. And then so your mindless competition, that's your atheoretical and formal statistical models that tend to do a little bit better. Um, okay, so Tetlock has done, you know, an analysis of thousands of people making tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of predictions. And he's done some analysis on who gets it right and wrong. And what he's found is that pretty much Nothing matters in terms of your typical behavioral factors. Doesn't matter what your background is. Doesn't matter what your education is. Doesn't matter what your ideology is. Conservatives and liberals are equally bad at getting things right. Um, he did find, however, that the more frequently you are on television, um, the less accurate you are at making predictions. And while the results ended up not being statistically significant, which causes me to sort of shrug and say, yeah, I'm not sure I actually buy that, Tetlock has a reasonably good explanation for why that pattern is what it is. And he says that television, particularly cable news, sort of incentivizes people um, to take a particular kind of perspective. Right, they, they bring you on because you're the person who's hawkish, or you're the person who's dovish, or you're the person who always will defend the conservative position, or always will defend the liberal position. So they're bringing you in because you are a reliable voice on a particular perspective. And furthermore, television encourages people to make provocative claims, that it encourages people to say wild and crazy things with confidence, because that makes for good television, being judicious and saying, well, you know, I really don't know, it could go either way, maybe it's 50-50, and we'll just have to wait and see, it does not make for good television. People don't feel like they're getting news when they're told that the world is messy and complex. So he's got a fairly good explanation, and we'll come back to this fairly good explanation a little bit, because it ties into this idea of, of hedgehogs and foxes. Um, but so does this other piece that he, he notes. It's that while it doesn't matter what your ideology is, liberal, conservative, whatever, what does matter is how strong your ideology is. Regardless of content, the stronger your ide ideological worldview, the worse you're going to do at making predictions and judgments. And when we sort of dig into why that is, I think it actually makes a lot of sense. And so um, Tetlock makes reference to this um, sort of story about the hedgehog um, that knows one thing, which is every single time there's a problem, the hedgehog sort of curls up into a ball and sort of shoots out of its spines. Um, and that's how the hedgehog responds to every problem versus the fox, which knows many little things. And so the fox has lots of little tricks in its toolbox to, to navigate the world where the hedgehog really has just one. Um, 
And so when thinking about prediction, Tetlock has said there are people who uh, behave like hedgehogs. They have one framework, they have one worldview, they have one way of understanding the world, and every single situation gets sort of smashed through that ideological or that sort of singular worldview. And as a result, they're working with limited data because they're focusing on things that that worldview tells them is important, but ignore stuff that isn't part of that story. Um, they're shutting out contradictory stories and data and models and ways of thinking. And it also leads, so it leads them to oftentimes missing things. So you get it wrong frequently, but it also creates a false sense of confidence, right? Because people who are ideological tend to believe that their ideology is useful, contrary to all evidence, that Tetlock has assembled, um, they tend to be very confident. And so when you say, how likely do you think your prediction is to come to you know, play out? People who are strongly ideological are much more likely to say, oh, 100%, I'm guaranteed, that's the way it is, as opposed to folks who are less ideological. Um, and so Tetlock sort of has identified those folks who are sort of articulating a single position as bad forecasters, as hedgehogs, versus the good hedgehog or the good forecasters, the foxes, um, that are maybe going to use a bunch of different lenses, a bunch of different theories. They're going to maybe track a bunch of different indicators. They're willing to listen to alternative views and alternate perspectives. And they tend to be less confident in their predictions because they tend to recognize that situations can be really complex, that things can be pushing in different directions, that the way things play out might be difficult to anticipate. And because they're sort of cognizant of all that complexity, um, their predictions tend to be more carefully calibrated and more accurately reflecting reality in terms of how things play out. Um, so this distinction between foxes and hedgehogs, which we see playing out here in this graph, um, is I think a useful way of thinking about forecasting and predicting um, and, the and the danger of relying too much on our own individual biases when trying to process information, work with data, and develop forecasts about the world.